Distinguished guests, it's a great pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Uh, a huge honour to be uh, opening the inaugural session of the LMNC. When I first thought about taking on the free dive, about travelling 100 metres under the ocean with nothing to breathe, I was looking at this huge challenge. Something that you're all familiar with. It had uncertainty attached. It had a risk of failure attached. It had the possibility of investing a huge amount of time and reputation without necessarily guaranteeing that we would secure the result. Do we commit or do we back off? So I decided to commit, as you have done many times, and then came the day of the free dive, and then it's successful, and then we look back. And what's the question we ask? Why didn't I set the bar higher? What was all the problem about? Why did it take me so long to commit and to decide to deliver? The uncertainty was worth it, the risk was worth it, we pulled it off. As I listen to everybody in advance of today, it feels like this is an enormous opportunity. Each and every single person in this room can touch the lives of people on this island. What an incredible privilege. Do we have the courage to commit, to create the vision and to commit, to deliver what may seem impossible to begin with? And of course, we'll look back in a decade's time for us in this room and wonder why we set the bar so low. But first, we're going to have to have the courage to commit. We don't do that together. Of course, we do it in collaboration, but this commitment is an individual decision that we will have the courage to risk, to move into uncertainty, to dedicate time and resources when there is no guarantee of success. Risk, uncertainty. Let me ask you, can I have a show of hands? Anybody in the room whose mother or father or grandparents, whoever cared for you when you were 10 years old, 11 years old, put your hand up if, if, when you left for school in the morning, they would say, bye-bye. Have a wonderful day today at school. Be sure to take risks today at school. Make sure the teacher understands there's another alternative point of view. It's your point of view. Do not let them silence you in the class until you have been heard. Just a show of hands, anybody who had this experience? No. Sometimes there's a hand from California goes up, but I, I'm not even seeing a California hand today. We were raised, trained, conditioned. Our psychology was built. Our neuroscience was created to survive in the industrial age, ladies and gentlemen. And we live in the fast-changing, disruptive, agile ideas economy. There's been a fundamental shift now. We can't wait until we have total certainty that we will succeed before we move into the danger, risky area. We still have to control those risks. We still have to be competent in how we manage that, how we protect others from the impact of that. But we have to now have the skill set to recognize that we were designed to operate in the world of the industrial age, an age where we were rewarded for getting it right in the opinion of a superior person who knew what right looked like. Now, any one of us can make the impact. The life-changing ideas and the business-changing ideas can come from anywhere within the organization, and the senior people do not know what right looks like. I'm not speaking about our laws, our morals, our regulatory frameworks. I'm speaking about how the best way is, what the best way is for us to move forward. That is now an uncertain, unquantifiable area. We know that Uber is building transport as a service. A driverless car will come in response to an app. No human involvement other than a coder. We know that's what they're building, but there as yet is no driverless car. That's the level of uncertainty that people are investing millions and billions upon in order to move forward. This is a human problem, and I want to take us today through this human experience, our shared human experience, to look at our psychology and neurology, work together on how we can make a difference. 
Step one. So we have to own this. We have to own this. We're looking at changing our performance, not looking to other people, not blaming other people. We have to own this, and we have to commit long-term and deliver. When you look at the greatest cricketers, athletes, musicians, scientists, they own their own performance. Let me take this a step further. What do you think of this, that we hold the pen that is writing the story of our lives? I know this is a co-creation with many other billions of people on the planet. But the fundamental, the key to why you are sitting in this chair today is you. The decisions you have taken in your lives. The courage you've shown to move forward and commit rather than pull away. How do we write this story? Because I want to be practical today. I want to bring you a framework for creating change. A framework that's been deployed in Apple, in Barclays, in GlaxoSmithKline. But more importantly for you, been deployed by me in the two challenges that Joanna very kindly spoke about. I want to keep it simple. So how do we write the story? Decision, action, result, the end. Agreed? We decide, we act, we get a result. Every moment of every day whilst you are awake. You did this this morning. You decided today to put on the clothes that we can see onto your bodies. Action, you put these clothes onto your bodies. Result, watching you come in, I think for 95% of the room, good decisions, good decisions. 5%, I don't know what you were thinking. Right? Decision, action, result. We start this at school. We think, I'd like to pass this examination. This qualification would be incredible for my future. This would open doors. Now, I'd really like this qualification. But I have seen smarter boys and girls than me fail this examination. People like me don't do things like this. If I tried, I would be with people who might laugh at me. I could invest my time and fail. And what kind of an idiot invests their time when there's a strong possibility, the risk that they will fail. So decision, action, result, I pass this examination. Now, some people are thinking, well, maybe he's going to tell me that I could have passed this examination if I put my mind to it, because we can do anything in life if we put our minds to it, right? I don't believe that. I do not believe that. So forgive me, let's differ if you do believe that. I don't think I will ever beat Mr. Usain Bolt over 100 meters at the Olympics, no matter how much I put my mind to it. And I'm okay with that. Here's what we know. We didn't show up. We didn't show up for something that mattered to us. And as you sit here, the impact you can have on so many thousands of lives outside this room, out there now, we have to show up. Decision, action, result. Do we show up? Do we have the courage to try, even though we may fail, even though the outcome is risky and uncertain? Or do we back away, keep our reputation safe, play it safe? And what I'm going to call this tiger metaphor, this thing that roars at us, that makes the heartbeat increase, the voices of self-doubt speak to us, makes us back away when we want to move forward. That's what I want to look at as we go through this time together. Firstly, I want to introduce the, uh, the jockey bet uh, where it was tested. I'll speak a little about free diving as well, which is diving deep under the ocean with nothing to breathe. Both of those things were done to test these theories, but they lived in industry before they were tested. They'll be delivered around 100 times uh, over the planet this year uh, in short or workshop sessions, and then they'll be delivered in larger programs as well. But let's look at the jockey bet. So uh, I took this bet to become a jockey in 12 months. It was a sales conference. There were 500 people. And the big man, he was a man and he was big, the big man said, stop. What have you ever done to prove that this works? And I said, we've used it with this company, we've used it with that company, what do you want? He said, I didn't ask you for your CV. I asked you what you personally have done 
to prove that this works. And I said something, ladies and gentlemen, you should never say to the big man at a sales conference. I said, what do you have in mind? Well, <laughs> he laughed. He said, if you don't mind me saying, you are a short man. And I did mind, very much. He said, if you don't mind me saying, you are also rather overweight, which I was fair. It was fair, it was true at the time, but I thought that was pretty hard feedback in a group of 500 people, right? That's a one-to-one -one conversation. I said, where is this going? He says, I bet you cannot use your amazing rules for taming tigers to become a jockey riding in your first race on the television live under British Jockey Club rules of horse racing in one year. One pound that you cannot do this in one year. And this was in the time, ladies and gentlemen, pre-Brexit, when one pound was worth a lot of money. <laughs> so I took the bet, I went home, I was very excited. I thought, you know, I could have taken a difficult bet, something hard, I could have had a marathon or a triathlon. I have to train every day in the rain. No, I have horse riding, which as you all know, is a sitting down sport. I have a sitting down sport, it's all okay which shows you how much I knew about horses, which was nothing. I went to a big government school in, in London. Anybody could go. Uh, there were some terrifying things at my school. There were some wonderful things at my school, but I never found the horses at my school. I knew nothing. I had been horse racing once in my life. It was a corporate hospitality event, and we didn't see any horses all day long. We were in a different part, so I knew nothing. So I got onto Google, I learned that jockeys usually start learning how to ride a horse somewhere between the age of three months and six months, which is very bad news when you're 36 years old, and I was 36 years old. I googled the weight. Did you know a jockey will start a horse race at a weight of between seven and a half and nine stone. Do not translate. All you need to know, on a scale, I must be maximum nine. I am 12. This means 25% of me has to find a new place to live, right? And I have no idea how you do this. So to make sure it was safe, I Googled jockey mortality rate. This was a bad Google. It was not safe. I went to bed very stressed. I woke up in the morning. I rang the only man I knew with any interest in horse racing, a man called Steve. I said, Steve, I've got 12 months to be a jockey. What's it like? He said, you won't like it. I said, why? He said, imagine you're, you're squatting down on the seat of your motorcycle. I said, OK. He said, they've taken away the brakes. I said, ooh. But they have installed a brain. Ooh. You hold on to the middle, which is not very secure, and then somebody else, not you, will turn the throttle to 35 miles per hour, 60 kilometers per hour, and you're going to go. And after a little while, you need to get faster, which you do by going down, pushing the handlebars, and when you want to get really fast, you take one hand off. I said, what about health and safety? Are they going to give me a, a, a helmet, a leather jacket? He said, no. You're going to get a silk jacket, and you're going to get a skull cap. And I didn't like it. I had no business trying to do this. My interest with you tonight is to challenge what it is you think you have no business delivering for your people in your organizations and in the wider community across this island, this beautiful island. What is it you think you have no business doing, but that you would inspire the world if you went forward and did together? Setting that long-term vision, sticking true to that plan, and delivering something truly extraordinary. Now I want to go into the framework that will assist us to do that. Principle number one, let me ask a question. How many people Put your hand up, please, if you have ever seen a movie. Have you ever seen a movie? Just a quick show of hands. I'm just checking that the, uh, the communication is working here, right? We've all seen a movie. Thank you. They're all the same, aren't they? I mean, we go and see them again and again, but they're all the same. We always meet, in the first seconds of the movie, a, a person. In their ordinary environment, 
living their ordinary life. That ordinary life might be in the world of the Terminator or Star Wars, but it is their ordinary life. And then a thing happens. Same in a sitcom, Friends. We've got, we've got two of them sitting, having a conversation. Chandler and Phoebe, they're sitting there having coffee, and suddenly Joey comes in and tells them about the thing that just happened, right? Now we have an episode of Friends. Let's bring it to life. As a teenage girl, her name is Dorothy. She lives in Kansas. It's black and white. I don't know why, but it's black and white. She doesn't like it in Kansas. Who would? It's black and white. And she's, she's keen for life to begin. She sings us a song to tell us how she doesn't like it. She wants to go over the rainbow where there's lemon drops and bluebirds. She wants a new thing to happen. Now, we could stay watching Dorothy go to college for the next hour. This isn't going to work. A thing has to happen. A thing does happen. The wind comes. It picks up her house. It drops her. When she wakes up, she's in the middle of the biggest dance number you've ever seen. She has killed a witch. She has made friends with a witch. She's got to go up a yellow brick road and defeat another witch who's got winged monkeys. Monkeys that can fly. In order to meet a wizard who will help her get back to Kansas, which she didn't like a minute ago, but now it's looking good. Change starts with an event. If you want to make something happen, you need an event. Now, here's what happens. We either wait for that event to come. Business people, the competition comes. Regulations change. We have to improve our game. Political people, the population changes. The voting changes. The, um, the, the international environment changes. You have to raise your game. We wait. Or, if we have the courage, we go and we create. Change starts with an event. The movies did not invent this. They copied us. Do you wait or do you create? And creating takes courage because the rest of the world doesn't see the problem coming. You have the vision to bring that problem forward and to make solutions come. Let me bring this to live with horse racing. So I thought, right, I put the phone down from my friend Stephen with the three times too large motorcycle. I thought, I must go on a diet and I must book a horse riding lesson. I did these things. I was in the pub on the following Friday. We like the pub in England on a Friday. And I was enjoying a pie and a pint of beer and some chips with my friends because we all know that calories cannot touch the human body on a Friday. You can eat anything on a Friday. It's okay. And today's Friday. Enjoy your dinner. My friend said, what have you done? What have you done, Mr. Jockey Man, that's bold? I said, I have been for a horse riding lesson and I am on a diet. They said, this is not bold. This is not bold. Many parts of the world will go on a diet this year to try and lose some weight. And many boys and girls aged six and seven and eight years old have had a go on a little horse, a pony. This is not bold. We think you should ring up racehorse trainers, the people who, uh, who, who create jockeys, the people on the television, the people in the newspapers, and ask them how you become a jockey. I didn't want to ring the people in the newspapers. I didn't want to ring the people on the television. Do you? I didn't want to ring the very people who could help me do the thing I had said to the world I wanted to go and do. Do you? Now, this problem of personal change is now a core skill. We can't go around saying this is the disruptive age, transformational age, change will never be this slow ever again and not study how we go through change, our psychology, our neurology. Our emotional experience. So, let me bring this to life. Why don't I want to ring these people? Why don't you want to ring these people? Let's understand this problem that we have. Because they would like to help you. You change lives. I'm just a guy who wants to ride in a horse race. I don't want to ring them because it's risky. Because there is uncertainty. But what risk? What uncertainty? Come on, core skill. There are only three types of harm that any human being can come to. Harm number one, physical harm. I break. No, this will not happen on a phone call. It might happen after the phone call with horses, but it won't happen on the phone call. Harm number two, money, my security, 
my ability to feed myself and to house myself and my family. No, this will not happen on this phone call. Harm number three, reputation, how you see me, and ego, how I see me. That harm, oh, bingo. The biggest barrier we have to committing to delivering our long-term vision to creating lasting, sustainable change is our ego, ladies and gentlemen. And later on today, I'm going to run a little experiment before we leave. We'll try it together. I'll invite you to risk your ego, and we'll see what happens. And we'd rather risk our money, or go skiing, or driving on a motorcycle on the roads of Colombo, because that's high risk, right? That's quite high physical risk. I'm amazed. So I don't want to ring them because they might think that I am ridiculous and I might think that I am ridiculous and I don't like this. So I ring them because I have to. They all say, no, you cannot be a jockey. You are too old. You are too fat. They haven't been on any courses about how to communicate. They just tell it exactly how it is, so, which is true. And you can't ride a horse. Uh. They're telling me how the world worked yesterday. We're all experts in how the world worked yesterday. Is what they're telling me provable as true? Is it real? Or is it their psychological beliefs or perceptions? One, I'm too old. Do you know where it says in the book of how to be a human being that at your 36th birthday, you will lose the ability to ride a horse quickly because I don't know where they say that. Secondly, I'm too big, I know, but I wasn't born big. This has taken me time and money and commitment, right? And if I put my time and my money in a different direction, if I have no underlying medical problem, and I do not, I will become small again. Thirdly, I can't ride a horse. Well, you have me, I can't ride a horse. But wait, 150 years ago, Everybody was turning up to work on their horse, right? How hard can it be to do this skill, to learn this skill? I'm back in the bar with my friends the next week. I'm not having a beer because I think this is possible. They have only told me their perceptions. They have not told me any provable reason why we cannot do this radical different thing. I said to my friends, give me something very bold. They said, ring three of the most senior people in all of British horse racing. I didn't want to ring them. Why? Will I risk financial harm? No. Physical harm? No. Reputation harm at this senior level? Yes. I ring them. I don't want to, but I ring them. My heartbeat's going. My voices of self-doubt are speaking. They all offered me help. Completely different. Within 48 hours, I'm having dinner with the most successful female jump jockey. And that's a jockey who races their horse at, at 60 kilometers per hour over a fence as big as me, just to make it more interesting. And at the end of dinner, this woman put a hand out. She said, I don't see why not. We start on Saturday morning, meet me here. We will go in two cars to my friend, the Olympic show jumper, Tina Fletcher. We will put you on a horse. We will make a plan, and in one year, you will be a jockey. Yes? Oh. Now, she wasn't supposed to say that. She was supposed to say, really? I'm your last chance. This is not possible. What you need to do is go home, drink beer, eat pizza, and watch Game of Thrones, and I would have said, oh, a reason to avoid the challenge. Thank you. But she didn't say that. If I touch this woman's hand, I have gone to Oz, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Decision, action, result. I have locked in new action. The course is set. Why have I locked in new action? Because there is no way that you or me are going to shake hands with a senior person we admire. They agree that they will help us do something which is high risk, creative, never been done before, and in your case will benefit hundreds of thousands, millions of people. There is no way when we shake that hand that we're not going to deliver the new action. There is no way she will ring me at 8 o'clock in the morning 
When I said I would be on a horse at six o'clock in the morning in England in the dark and the cold and the rain, and I have to tell her that we, uh, we had a late party at, at work last night, so I, I didn't go. This is never happening. What you do matters. Whose hand do you need to shake to start the process of change that you, as a senior political figure in this country, or as a senior member of the commercial and business community in this country need to embark upon in order to deliver sustainable change for your people? Whose hand do you need to shake, even if it is to research and to plan and not yet to deliver? Change happens with an action. We all have these rules in our head about how the world works. The experts in horse racing told me you have to be young, you have to be slim, you have to ride horses since you are three years old. It turns out that isn't true. We all have a set of rules in our head. This is the psychological conditioning, our perceptions and our beliefs, how the world works. It's different in other cultures. It's different around the world. Let me give you an example. These rules are designed to keep us safe. From what? Physical harm? No. Financial harm? No. Reputation and ego harm from delivering change. You're in a bar. Experiment. You're in a bar. And you see on the other side of the bar a human being whom you find attractive. And you think, I want to speak with that human being. I'm going to speak with that human being. I'm assuming that you are single when you're having this thought. You're not on a wonderful evening here at the Hilton in Colombo. That's wrong. You see this person, you think, I want to speak with this person. I want to speak with this person. I am going to the bathroom. I am going to the bathroom. And somehow we arrive in the bathroom. Not with our person. How does this happen? This rule book. We think, I'm going to speak to the person. And the rule book says, bad idea. Ooh. Why? Because that's a very attractive person. I know, I know. But you're not very attractive, are you? Oh. You're a little bit ugly. Really? Okay, uh, well, uh, that's hard feedback, but do you think I could overcome that with some, with some witty, charming conversation based on past experience in this situation? No. Good feedback. Well, look, uh, this person's seen me coming now. What should I do? There is a bathroom on the right. Divert, divert. We arrive in the bathroom. And isn't life good? Because for a moment, the evening changed. For a moment, there was risk. There was uncertainty. I had to do something with no guarantee it could work. I risked harm. We've been here before. What are the three types of harm that a human being can come to? One, physical harm. I get broken. Am I going to get physical harm? I hope not. Two, financial harm. Am I going to come to financial harm? Let's not discuss that. Number three, reputation and ego harm. I could look ridiculous in front of my new friends here in Colombo, and I would not like that. But the rule book kept me safe. The rule book told me it won't work. There's no point. People like you cannot speak to somebody like that. So I did not have to face the increased heart rate. I did not have to face the voices of self-doubt. I did not have to find the courage to move forward into uncertainty. I could blame this, the, the world and how the world works. I even got to blame this person for not wanting to speak to somebody like me. She's no idea that she's carrying the blame for this. Ladies, you can swap gender here. Anyone can swap gender here. It's not my fault. These rules are designed to keep us safe from ego and reputation harm. What are the rules you need to change about what you can do collectively as a political body, about your ability to do deals with those you need to do deals with within this nation and outside in order to deliver change? And what do you, commercial people, need to do? What rules do you need to challenge that are keeping you safe from driving the radical and exciting changes you want to bring about in the organizations? And whose hand do you need to shake to begin to move? <laughs>